uh, thank the organizers uh, and uh, Doug for inviting me to participate and share my thoughts. Uh, um, I'm a practicing neurologist and I live below the foramen. I've been in the, the Miami Project and working in the Spine Institute at the University of Miami, Miami now for about 10 years. And let me see if I can get this done correctly. Okay. Left mouse. Okay. Okay. And uh, just my interject a little humor. So when I came down to Miami, I, I knew I was going to be responsible for a few things, and this is, I guess, what I <laughs> I edited the slide, but it says Alberto. For the people in the back, I can't read. We've decided to give you more responsibility. From now on, you'll be responsible for everything that goes wrong. In some days, it does feel like that. Uh, okay. okay, back from the peripheral nerve to the spinal cord. Uh, I'm going <clears> to <throat> compare the, uh, th what we're dealing with, at least the, uh, the level of two diseases, uh, just to lay down a little bit of the playing field. Um, uh, start with uh, you know how the the injury occurs. You know first of all the spinal cord injury of course is very fairly well defined. We know what's causing it, how it happens. Whereas uh, the, uh, the, the, the we're a little more nebulous when it comes to idiopathic uh, transverse myelitis. So and that is uh, one major difference. Uh, spinal cord injury occurs in you know seconds to minutes, uh, usually you know seconds with uh, especially a when we were talking about trauma from an acute accident as opposed to something that may be slowly compressive from like an epidural hematoma or a mass pressing on the cord. Whereas the flavor that uh, in transverse myelitis is uh, uh, slower, hours to days. Uh, spinal cord injury is uh, rarely uh, progressive. It's, a, you know, it's an extreme monophasic event. You have the injury, the deficits occur. It's uh, rare to have a secondary uh, progression, although sometimes it happens. Uh, and, you know, we do see progression in transverse myelitis. The pathology that's seen in both diseases, uh, you know, there are sh some things that may be shared, but, you know, they're also different. And we've got to keep this in mind when we're not trying to apply one thing to the other. Uh, ischemia is a, a big component of spinal cord injury, which is uh, the lack of blood flow. The uh, necrosis or, you know, cell and tissue death are uh, very evident. Uh, there are some... Uh, forms of uh, TM or uh, the Vick syndrome that may have a uh, component of necrosis, but, uh, you know, certainly doesn't have that uh, as, as much in spinal cord injury. Edema or tissue swelling uh, can be seen in both, and the tissue hemorrhage uh, is always a component of traumatic spinal cord injury. So the pathology we're going to be dealing with is, uh, you know, so rather different. And the, uh, you know, uh, uh, TM has uh, limited models, and, you know, that's, I think, one of the parts that hinders, you know, the study of the disease. When you want to look at the pathophysiology, when you want to query what's going on, you want to ask questions of the system, you know, how can, how can I intervene? What are the, the cause and factors we uh, find ourselves limited? Where spinal cord injury has probably a plethora of models, and it goes uh, to the point where you create arguments of which is the best model to use. The uh, you know end result on a on a, on a chronic uh, phase uh, they're you know fairly similar when you look at the clinical patient we're going to have patients that are, have motor deficits uh, sensory deficits uh, deficit on autonomic autonomic function so the uh, when you get to the uh, stage of the late stages we're dealing with you know fairly similar things what were what may be elucidated from the kind of database that uh, uh, Dr. Kerr is, uh, has, is collecting is, you know, what's the long-term basis of, of what we see. For example, you know, pain, how often does pain occur on a chronic basis in the population of temporal, of uh, transverse myelitis, uh, spasticity, because those issues have probably been, you know, fairly better studied in spinal cord injury, and we have some numbers for that. Uh, as far as looking at to see what's going on, uh, you know, clinical studies, we uh, talk about inflammation, and we're kind of limited in what we can do with the spinal cord, and I'll t say a little more about that. But one of the things I look for is, you know, uh, neurologists are limited in what we can do. We don't like to take pieces of the brain and, uh, and, uh, uh, or spinal cord for obvious reasons. We image. And uh, images in the, spinal, in the spine have its limitations. We have interpretations of these grades of, uh, of shades and what they may mean. 
and, uh, and we tap. We do spinal taps and we analyze the fluid. Uh, there's really only one good study of the uh, cerebral spinal fluid findings in, uh, humans, uh, in human spinal cord injury. And this is actually done, uh, in a study that came out of Canada, the reason we were able to get this data is because pre-MRI you had to image the cord and you did wind up doing CT myelograms. So well, there was a retrospective study where the spinal fluid that was sent for analysis on a routine basis was collected and uh, about 50 odd patients. And you do have increases in white blood cell count. Uh, the, uh, uh, the mean was 49 white cells. Uh, the uh, standard deviation was fairly high. Uh, it was, you know, fairly mix of polys, lints, and monos. So, you know, there is a, an inflammatory component that you, you see in the uh, spinal fluid. And normalized this fairly fast. By the third week, the uh, counts were normal. There were uh, increases in protein that can, are nonspecific. The average was 125. They tended to be higher when you have a complete block. So if your injury had caused a block of the normal flow of spinal fluid and you tap below, generally you're going to have an increase in protein. Now, let me <laughs> regress a little bit into the experimental models. I think they're very important. And uh, the history of spinal cord injury, at least in, in trauma, is, uh, you know, uh, is, a, is, is, is very uh, full of uh, this, uh, try, trying to address this issue. And in, the, in addressing the spinal cord, we're always going to need and rely on them because of the limitation of the human spinal cord. You know, first of all, it's small. We're talking about something about the size of your pinky. It's uh, <coughs> relatively inaccessible. You know, thank God the design was... Uh, put the sturdy structure of bone to protect it. So we really can't get in there and, and look at it. It has a fairly complicated function. And uh, you know, if you ever uh, ask a neurosurgeon to get a biopsy of something in the cord, you can see how excited they get about it. So we really, you know, uh, <laughs> and I, I work on one very closely. And as, as aggressive as he is, it's difficult to get a piece of tissue. So you know, what happens is when you're trying to document the changes associated with uh, acute injury, well, any insult to the cord makes it a difficult task. If you're trying to see what's going on metabolically with the cord, what's going on with the blood flow, the histopathology, you're going to have to rely on experimental models. Oops, sorry. So uh, our progress in understanding the pathophysiology of spinal cord injury and the ability to develop novel treatments is going to continue to rely on experimental models of injury. Uh, <laughs> the slide has faded with age. Um, when I first got to the Miami Project, I was very interested in the laboratory medicine and uh, how to figure out how do, how do you model how do you model something? What's the best model for spinal cord injury? When you look at the epidemiology of this, the best thing would be if you wanted to mimic what the humans do is, you know, pack the rats in a, in a car and make them drink and drive. And then I moved to Miami. So if, if I were continue to do this and I would be uh, correct about it, I'd put somebody with a gun spraying bullets at the innocent bystanders. <laughs> Unfortunately, the uh, epidemiology has changed. In the big cities, the Knife and Gun Club is fairly active, and the, the incidence of spinal cord injury secondary to uh, you know, violence, especially gunshot wounds, has increased. But by far and beyond, we're talking about uh, um, automobile accidents, falls. Uh. Now, just to give you a little flavor of how complex it is to, to uh, mimic something like, uh, like a spinal cord injury, um, much less something like transverse myelitis, this is, this is what uh, once is up against when you're looking at the <coughs> developing a model. Uh, there's uh, a wide range in age of the injury, the uh, sex difference, you can't, uh, you, some things you can't control for. The level of the injury is uh, fairly varied. Uh, some of these you know, may not project well, but I'm, I'm not going to go through all of it. We have open and close injuries. Uh, to, uh, to try to mimic a, cl a close injury, which is what most spinal cord injuries is how they occur. Nobody does a laminectomy and has a spinal cord injury. You know, barring those that uh, might get you know, knifed from behind, it's usually, or a gunshot wound, the, 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 uh, the system is a closed system. That's very difficult to 
to, to mimic in the laboratory. So we rely on, on models that you actually have to open up, take the lamina out, you know, and aim, uh, damage the cord. The type of forces <coughs> that happen in the human injury are fairly, you know, fairly varied. You crush the cord, you pull on it, you extend it, you compress it, you distract it, rotate it. And uh, it, the, those are all fairly varied. If you look at the velocity of deformation of the spinal cord tissue, you know, somebody, you know, tripping and falling from this, this podium is going to be rather different from somebody going on a car 80 miles an hour. <coughs> With the, uh, in the human injury, you have a lot of associated bony damage, uh, remnant compression, disruption of the ligaments, instability, and uh, by the time they get to the hospital and actually get the, may get the pressure of the cord and get stabilization of the, of the vertebral canal and take the pressure off, you know, that, that certainly is a time period that varies and we sort of mimic in the lab. So the duration of compression is, uh, you know, uh, rather different. Uh, in the human, we don't, uh, iso the isolated injuries of the cord don't always happen. If you're involved in a big accident, you get polytrauma, and you injure other systems, the brain, uh, major internal organs, you come in in shock. And uh, of course, not everybody that's spinal cord injured is healthy. Uh, uh, unlike the, uh, the animals that are going to the laboratory, they have vascular disease, pre-existing heart. Hypertension, diabetes, various components of, of the of spinal stenosis as you, we get older. And, uh, you know, that's all hard to mimic. So something that would inherently seem simple to create in a laboratory is rather complex if you're trying to go from human to, to animal. And I don't expect you to read the slide, but when I uh, looked at this topic and I was uh, looking at, you know, as far back as uh, Galen in the second century, who made incisions in the cord and what he noted, these were, uh, there was no anesthesia back then, and I would say that uh, a lot of the early uh, literature is not too, uh, not too humane in, in uh, how animals were treated, but one of the things that he noted is when you made longitudinal incisions in the cord, the animal kept breathing. If you cut it, transect, transected the cord, the animal lost respiration, so that probably was one of the first, uh, you know, the first documented uh, <coughs> spinal cord injury model. After that, I, uh, there's quite a variety of them, and I won't go through them, where spinal cord injury models that I would say non-quantifiable. <coughs> if you're creating a model of something in spinal, in spinal cord injury, you want to be, do something that you can reproduce from animal to animal and something you can grade, mild, moderate, severe, you're going to be able to start, study it to see what's happening and try to derive some therapies. So <clears throat> most of these models outlined here are not. They involve either uh, squeezing the cord, uh, 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 centrifuging the animal, uh, explosive forces, just striking the animal uh, with, a <clears throat> with, a, with a board. Uh, don't quite qualify. Uh, I have two pages full of this. The uh, second models that have become, you know, the ones that we rely on are what we call, what I'll call quantifiable models. So those are models that actually <clears throat> you can grade the injury, you can reproduce it, you can take it from lab to lab. And the holy grail was uh, back with uh, a neurosurgeon, uh, Dr. Allen, in 1911. And what he did, he uh, dropped the weight into the exposed cord and he did it in dogs. But he had a tube and uh, he could drop a certain weight a certain distance. So if you drop a five gram weight, 10 centimeters, he'd quantify that as a 50 gram centimeter injury. And he could reproduce that to animal to animal. And that's kind of has been the, the variations of this theme is what's prevailed in the spinal cord injury community uh, as far as uh, cr creating devices for, for injury, although they're quite more sophisticated now. Uh, the problem with this, this type of, uh, of uh, measurement of gram centimeters was that a, a five gram uh, uh, weight drop uh, 100 centimeters would be 500, but a 50 gram weight by 10 centimeters would be the same amount. Yet the, you know, given a choice, I'd rather have the 5 gram weight because that's a lot less, you know, energy impacted on the cord. So it, it, it didn't really translate. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Uh, uh, Rivlin and, uh, and Tatter from Canada use a, a greater aneurysm clip where they, uh, a predetermined closing strength can could squeeze the cord. It's another popular model. Uh, in, uh, in the University of Miami, Brant Watson uh, did a photochemical lesion, which is more of an ischemic lesion, but it uh, reproduce uh, uh, lesions that you could grade via a laser. 
And uh, then the, uh, the pinnacle is uh, the uh, weight drop device, the NYU impactor, which is utilized in most laboratories and in, in the laboratories in the Miami project. There's, uh, <clears throat> this, kind of, this device uh, monitors the actual impact on the cord, mm -hmm. uh, the cord deformation, and you can have more control of the parameters. The, uh, there's a uh, Ohio State University impactor, which is a fancier, even fancier model, uh, does kind of a, a similar. So these are the two that has become the, the, the workhorses of uh, the spinal cord injury world. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Now, how, how good do we do? This is an uh, example of a, <clears throat> a human injury in the acute phase. And uh, this would be uh, a swollen cord. The black is all hemorrhage, and you can not see the, the elements of the cytoarchitecture of the cord, which would be a necrotic hemorrhagic cord. This is a severe you know, cervical cord injury. And when you go into the chronic stages, you start developing the uh, cystic cavities. And this is uh, a mm -hmm. uh, little different from the uh, pathology you see on the long-term in transverse myelitis. The uh, spinal cord injured uh, 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 pathology has more of these uh, cystic cavities mm -hmm. and uh, uh, don't see that as much in the, in the transverse myelitis unless they're severe and they have necrosis. <coughs> this is... Uh, a uh, thoracic lesion of a rat done three days post injury. It's an H and E stain. Uh, the tissue, as you can see, is fairly well destroyed, and this uh, gigantic blob is the uh, all full of blood. So the hemorrhage, hemorrhagic component can certainly be uh, recreated. This is uh, about two months out. It's a pl thin plastic section. Showing the typical, you know, lesion, which is uh, central, because the lesion tends to spread centrifug centrifugally out, mm -hmm. <coughs> full of macrophages in the center, and eventually, uh, you know, most uh, standard issue laboratory rats winds up with a post-traumatic cyst. Mm -hmm. So, <coughs> these type of uh, uh, impact injuries, you know, uh, produce a path reproduce the pathology fairly faithfully. Mm -hmm. Now, <coughs> if if we're going to develop the therapies, uh, one of the things we would like to do is, you know, what's going on in the, trying to run up the usual suspects. So the, what happens when the cord receives an impact? Well, first, you know, what we all see is the clinical manifestations of, of paralysis, complete or incomplete. Uh, right now, the, the spread in the humans is slightly more incomplete injuries than complete. Uh, you see, this, uh, when, when you study this in, in the laboratory, uh, there's a lot of the work done by uh, Weiss Young, there's a lot of shift in electrolytes, uh, potassium leaks out of the cell, sodium leaks in, calcium leaks in. You have the decrease in uh, critical enzymes in the membrane, and uh, you lose energy stores, and eventually what happens, you start seeing how the tissue starts uh, dying. Uh, now, what, uh, what has uh, people excited in the field is the, uh, the issue of secondary injuries, which is a series of autodestructive processes activated after trauma that promote neural dysfunction and tissue damage for hours or days following spinal cord injury. Now, having said a mouthful of that, you know, in the clinical side, while in the lab you start documenting all these changes that occur for hours or days after, afterwards, uh, we, don't see, we don't see that, uh, you know, you don't see much of uh, mm -hmm. clinical deterioration after a, after a uh, an imp, uh, human spinal cord injury. So it's a little bit of a paradox. Uh, you know, what makes us think that there's actually these processes going on, that there are secondary mediators that occur after the impact that we can, you know, have an effect on? The uh, first that was noted uh, uh, a while back was that the progressive nature of the morphological changes that occur spi after spinal trauma suggested that the damage to the cord evolved over time. So if you do an acute hit to the cord, minutes afterwards you take the uh, tissue out and embed it and look at it, you know, it's not quite that bad yet. Uh, it, over time, if you start sampling it, you see all this, you know, the necrosis and hemorrhage and, uh, and death develop. The onset of significant decreases in white matter flow are delayed until one to four hours following severe spinal cord injury. So if you start, you know, la laboratories have measured the critical the flow in the white matter and concentrating the white matter because that's what's carrying the, the, the tracks for what's going to function below. 
<coughs> Interestingly, too, there's uh, been some documentation that it evoked potentials, again, the laboratory animals can transiently recover in some, and then they disappear again hours or days later. So there's something going on there that implies that there's some secondary mechanisms. And, you know, last but not least is that if you treat the, quote, secondary mediators or uh, uh, drugs against uh, the, these processes, uh, you, you, know, the, you ameliorate the injury. So I'm not going to go into great detail into one, any one of these, uh, but just to run up the, uh, the list of uh, usual suspects, and it doesn't really uh, vary much whether we're talking about head trauma, whether we're talking about the stroke, spinal trauma, spinal ischemia. The, the, uh, these secondary processes, it's kind of the same menu that we read off uh, from laboratory to laboratory. You know, for, first one of the earliest things that were studied was ischemia because it's, uh, it's very evident that it happens in the uh, spinal cord and you get a, a marked decrease in the spinal cord blood flow, particularly in the gray matter, within minutes after impact. And, uh, you know, the, it's, it's a microcirculatory failure. It's not the uh, big vessels uh, being blocked up. The uh, white matter is more of an issue. There's been some arguments whether it's white matter, you know, hyperemia. Uh, I think most of the lab uh, results show that the white matter flow decreases. Uh, one of the uh, issues is uh, what, what's the level of ischemia for white matter. White matter is in, uh, in, in the court is fairly uh, resistant to ischemia. What the le actual level that you need to drive down the blood flow to to get failure uh, is not really known. Uh, but, you know, the ischemia has always uh, been a, a major component of uh, spinal cord injury and, you know, makes it kind of a double whammy. Now, now not only you have impact, but now you cut the blood supply. Uh, uh, the uh, second uh, 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 issue that's been studied a lot is the uh, edema, which is the swelling or the leakage of the uh, of, uh, of fluid and, pro and pro proteinaceous fluid outside into the extracellular space. The uh, uh, we're fairly successful in treating this in the human in, with the with the brain mass. We're fairly successful in decreasing intracranial pressure, but uh, treatment against uh, edema in the closed compartment of the spinal cord we haven't done too well in. Uh, calcium, you know, has a big role. You know, calcium is uh, very tightly controlled. When it uh, gets into the cell, whether it be through a leaky damaged membrane, through voltage-gated channels from inside in the mitochondria, through the NMDA receptor, there are various ways it gets in after injury, but it's fairly destructive. It sets off a uh, number of, of, of enzymes that uh, auto-digest. It's poison to the micro mitochondria. Uh, it activates calpain. So this uh, uh, calcium has uh, been implied, you know, fairly heavy in spinal cord injury. Uh, free radicals, the formation of free radicals and lipid peroxidation, uh, nitric oxide radical, uh, a very big component. That's one of the... Uh, 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 points where uh, it is thought that the uh, methylprednisolone helps in inhibiting the free radical reactions. These are mm -hmm. <coughs> byproducts of the uh, of the injury where you have uh, usually oxygen radicals that are very reactive. They attack the, the membranes. They break them down. They start the processes of lipid peroxidation or chewing up the membrane, and they're generally not good for the cell. Uh, endogenous opiates, it's, uh, this is uh, an interesting uh, story. It's, uh, you know, it came back from the uh, era of uh, John Holiday and Al Faden at, the, at uh, Walter Reed, where they uh, were uh, playing around with uh, models of uh, spinal, of, uh, of, uh, of shock, of uh, uh, septic shock. <clears throat> and uh, one of the uh, models that they used was a spinal shock, and they administered a opiate antagonist called naloxone, and notice that it reversed that, and there was uh, the issue that arose with that was, was, is there a role for the endogenous opiate system in spinal cord injury? And that led to a, quite a number of experiments where uh, they were implicated in uh, specifically the bad actor was dynorphin, which is a peptide, a 17 amino acid peptide, and its action at the kappa receptor. Uh, naloxone actually made it into the uh, uh, second uh, human uh, spinal cord injury trial, the NASCII-2, and it was not found to be beneficial. Uh, icosanoids uh, have also been implicated. 
uh, excitatory amino acids, the actions of uh, glutamate at the, uh, uh, particularly the NMDA receptor, a, the, infl the inflammatory uh, components of like cellular, the in invasion of neutrophils of the injury and macrophages, the uh, involvement of cytokines, and this is a mixed bag because it may be good and both bad to, to all of these. The, uh, again, arachidonic acid, and uh, uh, I'll go a little more into, just have another slide on the apoptosis, but uh, the inflammatory response to spinal cord injury that uh, I'm, that's been looked at uh, is, as far as the cellular component, it's a uh, early infiltration by neutrophils. It occurs fairly early within the, the first few hours. They were first thought to have a role in neuronophagia, but they actually contribute to further injury because they have a respiratory burst that serves as a source of free radicals. They also release products such as elastase, which can be, uh, pr promote more uh, neut neutrophils coming in. They also promotes uh, vascular damage. So they've, uh, the, the infiltration of neutrophils very, on, very early on in the injury has been implicated in the uh, propagating damage. Uh, the uh, second cell that's been focused in is the macrophage, and the macrophage influx starts also in the acute phase within the first day. But this one progresses, unlike the neutrophils, and persists into the chronic phase. You can see months and months and sometimes years out, you still have some macrophages hanging, on, hanging around. <clears throat> First, it's, it was thought they were cleaning up the injury, but uh, they may be doing more than that. They also have a respiratory burst and, and serve as a source of free radicals. They, uh, Andrew Blight has shown that they are associated with a, uh, a role in the myelination, and of course that's something that, uh, that would not be beneficial. They uh, are a source of quinolinic acids and TNF, which can have a, a tumor necrosis factor, a cytokine that can also have deleterious effects. Uh, in contrast, you know, they may have a positive role too. And if you all kept with the media, there's been a uh, the trans recent transplant of uh, activated macrophages into a lesion site. They uh, felt that in some uh, models it promotes uh, regeneration. So it's kind of a mixed bag. If we go back to the neutrophils, Martin Schwab has a uh, article showing that even though, well, though there's uh, quite an <coughs> intense neutrophil infiltration in some of the areas surrounding the lesion, the oligodendrocytes uh, are not decreased. So his uh, contention was that they may not be all that bad. The uh, you know, last you know, uh, wave that's, that's really hit uh, the secondary mediators in the process of ap apoptosis, which is uh, programmed cell death or suicide. And uh, this is uh, utilized by the body in, uh, when, during development to, you know, uh, uh, in, in processes that are, that are beneficial, but uh, somehow after activation in trauma and other disorders, you know, it can certainly uh, lead to uh, uncontrolled uh, cell death, which, but not the typical uh, uh, cell death that we uh, think of by trauma or necrotic cell death, but this is a cell death where there's no inflammation, where the cells are auto-digested by proteases and cleared by macrophages. There is no inflammatory reaction. So instead of the cell swelling up and, uh, and becoming edematous, the actual cells shrink, the DNA fragments, and it can be activated by various factors such as calcium into the mitochondria. It's been uh, fairly well documented now in the lab, that occurs in the lab. It occurs in, it's been shown in the human spinal cord injury. So, so no, we gathered up a list of, uh, of usual suspects. You know what 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 have uh, has uh, been done with this, and how uh, what kind of therapeutic you know treatments have, have been developed. You know, and unfortunately, when you look at the the number of of, of processes and uh, what's come out of the lab and what's made it into the clinical arena, you know, it's fairly limited. And before I go into that, I just want a couple thoughts of looking at this uh, as what we measure in outcome. You know, and because uh, it's the mainstay for telling what the drug has done. And usually, you know, we look at behavioral data and what's the, the, the standard is the, the, the BBB uh, scale that came out of Ohio State, which is how well a rat walks with, when you're doing the, the rat that's become the standard issue uh, animal for uh, spinal cord injury. You grade it on how it walks. Uh, you know, the problem with this is the, uh, these, these rats, you know, walk dragging themselves across the floor. 
Now you have a spinal cord injury, you have you know, stimulation, and then everybody that knows that anybody that has spinal cord injury, you're prone to spasticity, and now you're, you're of course, the animal, you can't isolate that movement, so anytime they're going to drag themselves, I think, <clears throat> you know, my feeling is that you're, there's always some degree of, of uh, input that affects this uh, type of grading, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, there's no way to get around that. You can look at electrophysiological data, you can collect morphological data, but people are always going to want, you know, what, what the behavioral, what did the animal look like, did that really help them? Uh, and as far as morphological data, you know, you have to be careful. I mean, there are some measures of uh, tissue, of volume of tissue death, and uh, I remember my discussions with uh, Dr. Richard Bungie back when uh, he was in the project. I'm demonstrating here two types of uh, injury, and uh, you know, if you look at the volume of, of tissue destruction, this is you know m much more than this one. Uh, and I've given a choice of which injury I'd rather have in my cord. I'd go with this one. So uh, you know we have to be careful when you're analyzing morphological data, looking at cross section, and be besides uh, just uh, rostrocaudal extent. Now what's interesting if we look at, and here we have to go again to the lab because we don't really know, uh, you know, from a human what is required to retain and how much uh, do we have to get back to, to give somebody specific function. And uh, this is uh, the 10% figure. It goes from textbook to textbook, to article to article. And it comes from the laboratory uh, uh, studies uh, in cats where there, it was found that at least ten, if you had 10% of the, uh, of, of the cord of the, of the uh, remaining, the uh, cat had uh, locomotion. And uh, is, that, is that what we need for a human? I, I, I don't know. The data is not in on that. We certainly you know, can see humans who have a spinal cord injury where there's a very little remnant tissue left and they, you know, they're, they're functioning to, uh, with some degree of impaired ambulation. And sometimes you, you see the injury and, uh, you know, there's, there's more cord substance. And the problems, again, getting back to the uh, images are images and they're not pathological, you know, data. But, you know, what would it take for, you know, hand dexterity, you know, to somebody to gain a quadriplegia to gain hand dexterity? We don't know. And that's also equally important. Uh, what does it take to gain, you know, back some degree of autonomic function? We really have no idea of that. And it's, uh, I, I, you know, obviously it doesn't come just to having 10% or I need 15% or whatever value is. I think what's more critical is the location of the spared parenchyma and its distribution. Uh, you can have 10% scattered diffusely across the cord. It's probably going to be less useful than if you have it focused in, in a certain tract as far as that function. So these are things that have to be looked at. The other thing that I, uh, that I you know, take that I think is very important from the uh, human spinal cord injury and look at you know, from the traumatic side and look at the, the lab and what we're doing, <coughs> the easiest model, of course, to take the animal and, and injure the thoracic spinal cord and create a paraplegic animal because the paraplegic animal is very easy to take care of relatively. Uh, but, you know, unfortunately, when you're looking at it, is that the same on what we're looking at when you go to a cervical cord injury? It's a world of difference between a, qu a quadriplegic and a, and a paraplegic. And in a, in a cervical cord injury, you're not only addressing the significant loss of white matter tracts, but now you're talking about neuronal loss and gray matter. And uh, this is just a, uh, a patient with a cervical injury just showing the intense uh, atrophy here of the first dose of inner osseae. So now, you know, you can connect things, but what are we going to do about this? So can, you know, we look at, uh, you know, what, 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 can we look at other areas of the cord? And unfortunately, it becomes difficult, but not impossible uh, to do this. And this is a part of a study of, uh, Steve Onifer uh, did, did in the Miami Project uh, with me back about five, six years ago. If you look at the literature from Parkinson's disease, uh, they are very interested in how an animal, a rat, uses his hands. And you can uh, create cervical spinal cord injuries to, in, in, a, in a rat. Uh, of course, they can't be severe. All they want is you have to run a little intensive care unit. And uh, that gets tough. <clears throat> but the, if you look at, you can do lesions of moderate severity. You can get impairments. You can measure the, 
the downside of it is there's there are more care and there is more intense labor wise as far as grading the behavioral scores but this is a normal rat uh, they don't have a thumb but you'd be surprised how well they do as far as grasping uh, with the, their four little digits and the little nubbing that's where the thumb would be and this is a rat uh, three months after a cervical cord injury at C7 and uh, what happens when you do a moderate injury, you get profound loss of uh, f finger extension, and they tend to get a fisted paw. And uh, talk about being labor intensive, they like to eat. And uh, <laughs> you don't have to train them too much to do this. I don't know what they put in these pellets, but it might be something akin to catnip, be ratnip. Uh, but they, they reached down, they, uh, we made this little platform, and this is adapted from the, uh, what, uh, Wishaw and Duncan, and uh, <clears throat> what you, the animal lays in a, in a, in a flat surface here, and they, they, it's got uh, two s uh, slots that they can stick their hands in on either side, and they're pellets uh, sitting in wells on the right or on the left, and a, uh, a normal animal, and this came out of blurry, but you know, will reach down, grasp the, uh, the, uh, the, the pellet, and, and eat them, and generally will clear down to the uh, first wells, the, I mean, the, uh, the next to the last well. Uh, this is uh, what happens on an animal that uh, had an injury that was affected, this was a low asymmetrical injury, the hand f remains fisted and they can't clear anything. So, you know, there are ways to do this and there are ways to address that. And I think it's very important when you're starting to look at, you know, what are we going to do as far as, you know, therapy and transplantation to look at both ends of the cord. And, uh, you know, <coughs> if, you, if you can buy a level for a thoracic uh, injury, you're... Uh, uh, you haven't really gained a lot as far as that unless you gain long track signs, I mean long track function. If you buy a level for a person who's a quadriplegic to go from uh, uh, C6 to C7 and get uh, triceps back or you know, go down into C8, T1 and start getting your hand back, it's a, it's a world of difference in, in the independence. So I'm not, uh, Dr. Dietrich, uh, my colleague, is going to uh, cover uh, more than uh, neuroprotection, but the, uh, uh, what has been tried and what has made it to the, cl to the clinical? <clears throat> well, the, one of the first things was hypothermia, and hypothermia uh, had a big wave, you know, back in the 60s and 70s. But the, the problem is we t had to cool the cord, and we tried to, the, tried to cool the cord focally, and you had a, a unstable... Uh, spinal cord injury patient who you had to do a laminectomy, you had to get to the area of injury, and you had to do it fast. And it, it kind of lost, lost, uh, lost steam. And uh, a lot of the work that's come out from the, uh, the University of Miami that's resurfaced this theme is the fact that, that it looks like you don't have to cool the cord down to drastic, you know, drop the, the, the temperature 10, 20 degrees. You can do modest, you know, 3 degrees and still protect. So that has resurfaced. Uh, it hasn't made it out. It's been tried out in the head injury uh, clinically, but it really hasn't made it out well into the uh, uh, clinical spinal cord injury, uh, at, at least at a modest level. Uh, the tr uh, treatment with steroids is our mainstay, and that's been a, a double-edged sword. The uh, the the big trials have been in, uh, with, uh, you know, steroids. There's been three uh, national uh, spinal cord injury uh, trials, uh, both with a, uh, quite a, a number of, of patients can try to enroll about 500. So it takes cycles every five years, and uh, methylprednisolone has been the common theme. And that's been the, uh, that became the standard of care back in 1990 when uh, Bracken and colleagues pu published an article in the New England Journal. Uh, the problem with uh, the, that particular, you know, s study is that uh, the the gains from that, if if you believe them, there's a lot of uh, uh, created a lot of ruckus and a lot of uh, debate. Is that uh, uh, the gains are you know fairly modest, at best, and, and there's still an argument whether they work or not. Regardless, it's become the standard of care and to 
uh, withhold it, you know, nobody would do that now. And what happens is uh, any drug we're going to have to test is going to have to be uh, used along steroids. So we're looking at drug interactions. And, you know, what are we going to do with that? So we, it's kind of hard to do a clean prep anymore. The opiate antagonist uh, story uh, kind of died when uh, naloxone didn't make it in the second uh, cooperative study. Uh, uh, excitatory amino acid antagonists, uh, quite a, a, a body of uh, literature supporting its use in spinal cord injury has not made it out into the clinical arena. Calcium channel antagonists have uh, been a problem in the lab because of the um, effects on blood pressure. Uh, uh, some of these will uh, drop the blood pressure down. And one of the problems you have to spinal cord injury clinically is, you know, you get neurogenic hypotension. Uh, GM1 ganglocyte story. Uh, did make it to the uh, clinical. This is a uh, ganglocyte. It's a component of the mammalian uh, uh, nervous system. It uh, had uh, beneficial effects in, in models of uh, head injury, in uh, models of uh, stroke, and some limited in spinal cord injury. It had a, a big cooperative trial where in humans, where it was piggybacked to the methylprednisolone. It was started uh, within 72 hours of the injury. Supposed to methylprednisolone try to give in the uh, have to give in the first eight hours. Uh, it had uh, at least beneficial effects in recovery of function faster than the control group, but they kind of they level out in, in the chronic phase. So the issue of this hasn't been settled. The, what would have happened if the treatment had been continued? The treatment was given for about a month. Uh, antioxidants to uh, quell uh, free radicals uh, and the like, have, uh, they have not made it out to the clinic. There are a number of very exciting growth factors that have, you know, uh, like uh, BD, uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factors, nerve growth factors, et cetera, that are very exciting uh, results in the laboratory, have not made it out yet. And there's some uh, interleukins, and I, uh, interleukin 10, uh, uh, John Bethea in the, in the Miami Project has uh, tested this out in spinal cord injury and found it to be beneficial, but still not, not quite ready for prime time. And there's quite a body of, uh, uh, of uh, laboratory experiments in, in the inhibition of the, the uh, migration of, uh, of uh, neutrophils and macrophages into the lesion that are uh, proven to be beneficial. But again, has not made it to, uh, to the clinical arena. So uh, even though we have you know, fairly good you know, models we have quite an extensive menu to, uh, to take it out to uh, the clinical arena has been rather difficult. Uh, as far as the chronic injury, which is a different issue altogether, you know, we, we're looking at the pharmacological uh, treatment such as enhancement of conduction of the myelinated fibers with uh, drugs like a 4-aminopyridine. Uh, you know, the, the, that may be more beneficial in the transverse myelitis where there's demyelination. The problem with spinal cord injury is no, but we know there is demyelination. We, that's been shown in the human. It's been shown in the animal models. The problem is you don't know from injury to injury, you know, who, uh, how much there is. So as a, and you can, uh, there's a, it's difficult to how to find out what each patient has. The uh, Accorda, uh, you know, trial of this drug has not been uh, finalized yet. But, uh, you know, it's been kind of hard to demonstrate specifically uh, improvement in functions and in, in neurological function and some of the parameters that were, they were looking at were spasticity, sexual function, bowel and bladder, et cetera. Uh, so it, it, it may pan out more beneficial in enhancement of, uh, with uh, the myelinative, uh, more purely the myelinative lesions. Uh, transplants will be covered. You know, obviously, this is the, the wave of the future uh, for the treatment of the chronic injury. And, uh, you know, I'm always asked by, uh, you know, patients what, what kind of hope there is, you know, what, what is there. And I, you know, compared to 20 years ago, I think there's uh, quite a bit of hope. First of all, the number of cells and the type of cells that one can place in the spinal cord now, you know, it's, uh, it's rather different than the, uh, what was done before, you know, for many years, the plopping in of a piece of fetal, fetal tissue that, you know, was rather limited in its effects. But we're looking at uh, specific cells such as swan cells, or olfactory seeding epithelial cells, stem cells. You can genetically modify cells. And, uh, and uh, as was done, activated macrophages. 
the addition of growth factors and the neutralization of inhi inhibitory factors that have profound effects, at least in the laboratory uh, setting. And I, when you look at the continuum of uh, what, can be, uh, what can be done for the, uh, approaching the treatment, you have to look at the time base and to, th to think that it's going to be a simple thing of one drug doing something, it's going to be unlikely. It's uh, probably going to be some kind of cocktail we're going to have to derive. <clears throat> but if we look at the time base of the injury and what we can uh, uh, work on the, from the acute impact where the traumatic forces is what's the active factor, it's the only thing that's going to really help is prevention. So you know, wear a seatbelt, uh, dive with your feet, and don't dive, jump feet in first. Uh, but once you have the injury, uh, when you're lo talking hours to days, then we're talking the standard clinical and uh, medical treatment and you know, preventing hypoxia, correcting the uh, stabilization and compression of the cord, uh, co correcting hemorrhage so there's no, hypotension, no additional hypotension and injury to the, to the cord. And while that may seem uh, rather mundane, I must remind folks that the, if you had a spinal cord injury before uh, pre-World War II, your outcome or your prognosis of survival was dismal. The mortality of spinal cord injury now, traumatic spinal cord injury, is probably in the neighborhood of 5% with the you know, care in the units and the, uh, the, uh, in the rehabilitation centers. Uh, of course, as far as secondary mediators, we're you know, stuck with the, uh, the, uh, uh, the methylprednisolone uh, protocol. Uh, of course, we're going to rely on new, new, growth, new drugs and growth factors uh, com uh, coming. In, uh, in the very chronic phase, of course, we're looking at transplants. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, I'll leave you with a, 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 a sentence from the Edwin Smith the Surgical Papyrus, about 2000 BC. Actually, it's, it's kind of interesting history on this paper. It was a, a treatise or, uh, that came out of Egypt. Uh, taken by Edwin Smith, an uh, Egyptologist, as best as I can tell, it was pilfered from there and brought over here and translated. But it deals with uh, a, a number of cases of head injury where observations were made uh, of the uh, clinical aspects of the patient and others of spinal cord injury. And uh, the, unfortunately, this statement held true for many years and obviously does not now, which is uh, regarding a spinal cord injury, thou shalt say concerning him, one having a dislocation in a vertebra of his neck while he's unconscious of his two legs and his two arms and his urine dribbles, an ailment not to be treated. And I think we all disagree with that. And, uh, you know, nowadays it's, uh, that's not the case. And I think there's, uh, you know, hope with uh, the progress that's being made in the laboratory. And with that, I'll end.